Tenemos la primera presentación a cargo de Jessica Woodhams, que viene de la Universidad de Birmingham. Eh, ella va a hacer la presentación en inglés, lo que pasa es que hemos traducido las, las diferentes, bueno, la presentación para que puedan ir siguiendo y también tienen un texto en el que pueden seguir un poco el resumen de la, de la conferencia. Yo voy a dar, eh, dar paso a hacer la presentación de ella en español, voy a dar paso a, a su conferencia y después abrimos un turno de, de preguntas, que si quieren hacerlas en inglés no hay ningún problema y si no intentaré en la medida que pueda y con la ayuda de un poco de todos eh, traducir. Eh, para mí es, bueno, para nosotros, ¿no? el equipo de investigación que, que, que ha tratado de, de avanzar en la investigación policial es un honor tener a Jessica con nosotros porque precisamente es pues una experta en lo que nosotros hemos intentado hacer con el proyecto, ¿no? que es intentar construir un instrumento que permita avanzar en la investigación, ser más eficaces en la investigación policial a partir del estudio de, eh, de las variables más comportamentales, ¿no? las variables que nosotros encontramos en las en el crimen o que, o que de alguna manera recogemos por otras fuentes y a partir de eso predecir variables eh, individuales, ¿no? intentar identificar precozmente a los sospechosos, ¿no? posibles sospechosos de un determinado crimen a partir de esas variables comportamentales. Ella lleva muchísimo tiempo de, de estudio en, esta, en este campo, es una verdadera experta y además proviene Ahora voy a leer un poco su currículum, pero proviene también de, inicialmente inició su carrera en el ámbito policial, por lo cual tiene un origen en, y un conocimiento eh, policial extraordinario y después se fue al mundo académico. Y entonces yo creo que conjuga muy bien… Eh, los dos, los dos aspectos más importantes aquí, que es tener el conocimiento de la estructura y del funcionamiento de la investigación criminal con un con una enfoque más científico que luego ha aportado y realmente eh, mejora eh, las investigaciones y está continuamente eh, trabajando e investigando para la policía y para mejorar eh, las, las, los instrumentos ¿no? a, a cargo de la policía para la investigación, sobre todo eh, de agresores sexuales. Ella es, como he dicho, psicólogo forense en Gran Bretaña, en la Universidad de Birmingham, pero también es directora del Centro de Psicología Aplicada en la misma universidad y codirectora del Centro de Crimen, Justicia y Policía. Como ya he dicho, empezó su carrera como psicóloga forense eh, y analista criminal en la Policía Metropolitana de Londres, especializándose en homicidios y delitos sexuales con víctima desconocida, que es el tema un poco que nosotros vamos a plantear hoy. Se pasó al mundo académico en 2002 e hizo su doctorado en jóvenes agresores con víctima desconocida, tratando de priorizar los agresores según su probabilidad de ser seriales y con un estudio sobre agresores en grupo. ¿no? Eh, durante su carrera también ha sido consultora de la Policía Metropolitana de Londres, de la Oficina Escocesa de la Corona y de otras muchas policías, tanto de Gran Bretaña como de, del extranjero. En 2013 ganó un premio, el Lever Hulme International Networks, y después eh, fundó el CELIN, que es Crime Linkage International Network, eh, una red de profesionales e investigadores con un interés en la relación entre el delito y los aspectos comportamentales. ¿no? Eh, como ya he dicho, eh, una experta en la materia justo que nosotros vamos a presentar luego en el, en el panel siguiente y yo creo que eh, es perfecto tener, tenerla a ella, que nos exponga un poco el estado de la cuestión en, en su línea de investigación que tanto está relacionada eh, con lo nuestro. Sin más preámbulos, doy la palabra a Jessica para que haga su exposición y luego podrán hacer preguntas o, o hacer algún un comentario posteriormente. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me today to open your conference. It is a great honor for me to be here, so thank you very much. Um, my name is Dr. Jessica Woodhams, and I am a forensic psychologist in the United Kingdom, where I work at the University of Birmingham. I have been researching stranger sexual offending since 2002, when I started my career in academia. However, before then, I was a crime analyst for the London Metropolitan Police, where I specialized in the analysis of stranger sex offenses. My role there included using crime scene analysis to identify cases of stranger sex offenses that were committed by the same offender, commenting on the veracity of rape allegations made to the police, so whether the allegation was thought to be true or false and the geographical profiling of sexual offences. 
Um, during this time, I also analyzed uh, serial murders and robberies and burglaries, but my main focus was on stranger sex offending. So as you will know, stranger sex offenses are some of the most difficult crimes for the police to solve. Therefore, it's very time consuming for the police and they utilize a lot of police resources. In addition, the impact of sexual offending for the victim can be substantial. For example, victims' reactions to rape include post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, fear, depression and anxiety, alcohol and or drug abuse, low self-esteem, experiencing feelings of self-blame and loss, and also sexual dysfunction. The human cost of stranger sexual offending is therefore considerable for both the victim and his or her social network. Further, while it might seem crude to us, scientists have tried to calculate the financial cost of a rape to the victim and to society, and more than a decade ago, this was estimated to be £94,000 per rape, which is roughly equivalent to uh, €105,000 per rape. So it is going to be much higher nowadays because this was 10 years ago. So when you consider why we'd want to focus our attention on serial sex offenders, this would include preventing the suffering of future victims, but also reducing the crime rate. A well-known statistic cited in criminology is that 50% of crime is committed by 10% of offenders. Therefore, targeting prolific offenders, such as serial offenders, can protect society in one of the most efficient ways. So stranger sex offences are therefore a type of crime with considerable human... Excuse me, just, just the, the micro little bit. Nearer. <laughs> So stranger sex offences are therefore a type of crime uh, with considerable human as well as economic cost for all of our countries. It follows, therefore, that it's an important topic to research, which is why it is so positive for me to be opening a conference today uh, where we will, be, we will be hearing about the latest research on this topic. When I was invited to speak today, I was asked to set the scene for the presentations to come by explaining to you what we know regarding stranger sex offences, the perpetrators that commit them, and how psychological and criminological techniques can be used to apprehend them. So I will therefore briefly take you through what we know so far, starting with what we know about the perpetrators, and then what we know about the offences, and finally how psychology and criminology might be harnessed to detect and prosecute these individuals. So in terms of what we know about the perpetrators, we actually don't know very much. Most studies of incarcerated sex offenders do not break the offenders down by the type of victim that they targeted. And so they don't differentiate between intimate acquaintance and stranger rapists. Research with psychopathic rapists has found that these individuals are more likely to target victims who are strangers to them, so we might expect a higher rate of psychopathy in stranger rapist populations. And studies of risk assessment show that stranger rape is associated with impulsivity um, and also a greater risk of reoffending. So stranger rapists would therefore certainly be a type of offender that we would want to target, not only from a policing point of view, um, but certainly from a rehabilitative point of view as well. However, what I have said so far assumes that rapists stick to the same victim type across all of their offences. So in other words, they only commit their offences against strangers. But a recent literature review conducted by one of my PhD students, who's called Kari Davies, indicates that this is not the case and that some stranger rapists also assault acquaintances as well as their intimate partners. So to give you some examples of this crossover, in Heil et al's study, 90% of the sex offenders that they sampled varied in the type of relationship that they had with their victims. The figure is lower in other studies. So for example, in Can et al, they found that 14% of offenders cross over in terms of their victim-offender relationship. 
However, it's still important to note that sex offenders do not necessarily stay within victim type, and this has important implications for making decisions about how offenders are managed within the community, as well as the policing techniques that we use to detect them. In terms of the offending behavior of stranger sex offenders, there are more studies that have been published, but there is still by no means an excess of research studies. So for example, in 2004, I published a study about the characteristics of juvenile stranger sex offenders, and we found that most of the offenders were male, and most of the victims were female, and the women were aged between five and 77 years. Some of the offenders were very young, so there were offenders who were aged under 10 years old, and approximately 50% of the sample offended either in a duo, so two offenders together, or as a group. Outdoors was the most common offense location. Con approaches where the offender speaks to the victim on approach, and surprise approaches where the victim is suddenly grabbed by the perpetrator were the most common type of approach. In contrast, blitz approaches, which is the use of overwhelming and immediate violence against the victim, were rare. While only 10 to 15% of these offenses that were committed by juveniles involved sexual penetration of some sort or physical violence, it was interesting to note that both of these behaviors were associated with duos um, or groups of offenders rather than with offenders who acted on their own. In 2012, Gerard Labuscagni and I published a paper which compared the behaviors of serial stranger sex offenders across multiple countries. We had been studying the behaviors of stranger sex offenders in South Africa, and we were interested in how they might compare to these offenders and their offenses in Europe um, and also in North America. So there were too many findings for me to tell you about now. Um, however, I will take you through a selection of them. It's not very clear, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, what, you, what you might be able to see on this slide is that the samples date back uh, from 2001 and come from several different countries. So within our paper, we talked about offenders from the UK, uh, Canada, Finland, and the United States. Um, all of the offenders were male in these studies, but that just might be an artifact of the samples that we use, so how the um, perpetrators were collected. Um, similarly, the most common offender-victim relationship were that the offenders and victims were strangers to each other. Most victims were female, and again, from the full span of ages, so from very young to much older. The most common length of each series was just two offenses long. However, there were also some series of considerable length. So some series lasted 32 offenses. And it's important to remember that these will only be the offenses um, which have been attributed to the offender on the basis of a conviction. So there will be other crimes for which they were not convicted, um, and there will be many crimes that were not reported to the police, or even if they were reported to the police, they weren't attributed to these particular offenders. Regarding their offense behaviors, there's considerable variation across the countries uh, in terms of the style of approach that the offender uses. So whether the offender approaches the victim using a con, uh, whether he surprises the victim or whether he uses a blitz attack. <clears throat> There's also variation across countries in the number of offenders that use a weapon, their use of threats and physical violence towards the victim, their forensic awareness, the use of binding and gagging, and the theft of property. In terms of what we found for South Africa in particular, Similar to previous studies, most of the victims were female, and again, there was a wide span of victim ages. The most common series length was three offenses long, but these ranged from two to 65 offenses. Regarding the offense behaviors, we found further differences in sexual behaviors, differences in the levels of violence used against the victim, and the types of weapons used in South Africa compared to other countries. So for example, 
the sexual behaviours in South Africa were much more about the sexual gratification of the man. The offences themselves were more violent. Um, there was more weapon use, in particular firearms. <coughs> Such differences seem to be related to the social norms of the country and also the sexual practices within the country and the wider population. So we also found variation in the ways in which the rapists approach their victims. So for example, the sorts of con approaches used um, varies across countries depending on what makes a victim vulnerable in each country. Uh, in South Africa, the high level of unemployment in the country means that the con approach of um, going up to a victim and saying that you have employment for him or her for that day is very effective. And so because it's so effective, it's very prevalent. Whereas in the UK, that type of approach wouldn't usually be used. Also, cultural norms in South Africa about respecting your elders and assisting them when they ask you to help means that seeking assistance was a very effective con approach for adult offenders to use with children because they would go with the adult willingly. The use of vehicles in offences was quite rare and seemed to be associated in particular with white offenders and this just reflects the general patterns of um, car ownership in the country. White offenders tend to own cars. So I think what we can see from studies such as these is the importance of studying stranger sexual offending in different countries and that we don't assume that the findings regarding stranger sex offences in one country will generalise to another country. Okay. In the 1990s and the 2000s, David Cantor and his colleagues were using multidimensional scaling to investigate the underlying structure of behaviour seen in stranger sex offences. And a finding that has come out of many different studies is that stranger sex offending behaviour falls into three different themes. One cluster of crime scene behaviours appears to denote the offender treating the victim as a person. <coughs> Sorry. In other studies, this is referred to as pseudo-intimacy or a pseudo-intimate rapist and would represent behaviours such as complimenting the victim, kissing him or her, and trying to arrange to see the victim again post-offence. The second cluster or theme of behaviours reflects treating the victim as an object, where the victim is just um, an object for the offender's desires. Um, it is argued here that the victim just serves the purpose of sexual gratification and interactions with the victim are limited to what is required to achieve the offence. The final theme is the victim as a vehicle and relates to the victim being used as an outlet for intense emotions felt by the offender, such as him feeling angry and frustrated. So in such offences, we might see the excessive use of violence against the victim, um, or spitting on the victim, or shouting expletives, so swearing at the victim. And while these three different themes have been replicated across multiple studies, this is not to say that offenders fit neatly into one of these themes. So several offenders display behavior that cuts across themes. So having said that, it's, these themes are still useful. So when you are trying to interpret the behavior of a stranger rapist, it can help you as a police practitioner in your work. So for example, due to victim interference um, and victim behavior in an offense, an offender may not replicate the exact same behavior across his crimes, but the behavior that he shows may lie within the same theme. So it's useful for interpreting his behavior. Okay. Sorry, I have a cough. <laughs> Um, also, during the 1990s and 2000s, studies were being conducted of the geographical behavior of stranger sex offenders. In 1995, <clears throat> Anne Davies and Andy Dale assessed the distances over which stranger sex offenders would travel to commit their offenses in the UK. They found that the majority of offenders committed their crimes within eight miles of their home, or about eight kilometers. 
Research by David Cantor and his colleagues tested theories from environmental criminology, such as distance decay and crime pattern theory, showing that most offenders were what they called marauders and would travel outwards from their homes on radial lines to offend, therefore making it possible to predict their home location from their offence locations. However, there remained a subset of offenders termed commuters who would travel to specific locations for their crimes, usually due to the victim type they were um, targeting and that victim type being clustered in particular locations that were not related to the offender's home location. So, for example, if they are targeting students or sex workers, those groups of people tend to be clustered in particular geographical areas. For this group of offenders, it therefore wouldn't be possible to predict their home location from their offence location. <clears throat> Recent findings by the German police, so the Bundeskriminalamt, has replicated such findings, showing that impulsive, opportunistic crimes tend to be focused in a small geographical area. However, premeditated, planned crimes are associated with commuting, so traveling outside of your normal area to offend. Like Davies and Dale, most of the stranger rapists in Germany traveled less than 10 kilometers from their home to commit their offenses. And a new recent study in the UK by McManus and colleagues of approximately 500 stranger rapists <coughs> excuse me, has shown that more than half offended within 1.6 kilometers of their home. <coughs> Sorry. Turning now to how criminology and psychology might support the police in detecting and apprehending such offenders. These findings regarding the travel patterns of stranger and serial rapists suggest that geographic profiling should have some success. Geographic profiling is the prediction of an offender's home location or another location of significant meaning for him or her from the location of his or her offences. It can help in reducing the number of suspects that the police must investigate, or at least it can suggest a priority order for such a list, and it can reduce or help prioritise the geographical area for searches or stakeouts, for letter drops, um, or for DNA sampling. Geographic profiling relies on offenders following a marauding pattern to their offending. Therefore, for serial stranger rapists, the findings I've already referred to would suggest that this should have some potential with these offenders. So to illustrate for a marauder, his or her home should fall within a circle drawn to encompass the two furthermost offences within his series. So the circle represents the offender's criminal range, so it's the area within which he will commit his crimes. And the home range is where the offender habitually operates as a non-offender, so his routine activity area. And for marauders, these two areas overlap. Also, just to give you an example of what a geographic profile can look like, so these are the sorts of density maps that are produced with the hot areas, so the areas in red representing where the offender's home location is likely to be. <coughs> Another method for targeting stranger sex offenders comes from psychology and is referred to as crime linkage. This police practice was a key part of my role when I was working for the police and has remained a significant part of my research as an academic. Crime linkage is the identification of behavioral similarities between offenses that point to them being committed by the same offender. It is known by many other names, such as linkage analysis, case linkage, and behavioral linking. It holds many benefits for the police if conducted accurately. For example, it means that limited police resources can be deployed most effectively. Physical evidence from multiple crime scenes can be pooled, and victims of crime series gain credibility from one another. It can also be used to prosecute someone for multiple crimes, even if there's not hard physical evidence against them for all crimes in a proposed series. 
crime linkage, <clears throat> as shown here, involves the detailed analysis of crime scene behavior to determine if a crime is likely to be part of a series. First, the analyst must familiarize him or herself with the circumstances of the crime and the behavior of the victim and the offender. <clears throat> The analyst must interpret the behavior displayed by the offender and how he or she interacted with the victim and determine which of these behaviors are salient and likely to be repeated in one, another offense. Through a recent study of crime analysts in the UK, we've been able to map how police analysts make decisions such as these. For example, they will focus on behaviors that were initiated by the offender the inference being that such behaviors are important to him and therefore likely to repeat, be repeated in future or past offenses. Similarly, they will focus on behaviors that the offender repeats throughout the offense. Having identified the behaviors that are salient, the analyst then searches for other offenses that share these features. In identifying similar behavior across crimes, the analyst must also consider how distinctive that behavior is. If a behavior is uncommon in stranger sex offenses in general, then it would constitute stronger evidence towards the offenses being part of a linked series. If the analyst has access to a database of sexual offenses like they do in the UK, they can use this to calculate the rarity of a behavior, but also the rarity of a combination of behaviors. So crime linkage rests on the assumptions that offenders are consistent in their crime scene behavior as well as being distinctive from their peers. There are several studies now with stranger sex offenses that support these two principles that underlie crime linkage. These studies originate in many different countries, including the UK, Finland, Belgium, South Africa, the Netherlands, Japan, and New Zealand. <coughs> While none of these studies are a test of crime linkage in terms of how it is actually conducted in practice by police crime analysts, they do provide initial support for its practice since they show that the assumptions underpinning crime linkage hold for most offenders, although not all of them. Another well-known psychological technique associated with police investigations of serious, serious crimes like sexual offenses is offender profiling. Offender profiling is a term most often used to describe the prediction of offender characteristics from their crime scene behavior. It has been the subject of some academic research. However, much of this comes from the last decade. Also, bearing in mind how much it features in popular media, such as television programs, there is surprisingly little empirical research on it. To mimic the content of the sorts of offender profiles that are written for the police and given to them, these studies have focused on investigating what associations there might be between crime scene behaviors and the offender's demographic characteristics. So in other words, the offender's gender, their age, their ethnicity, um, their relationship with the victim, and their employment status, and their relationship status as well. That, that there will be a relationship between crime scene behavior and offender characteristics is called the homology assumption. There have been some studies conducted which have shown simple relationships between crime scene behavior <clears throat> and the previous convictions of an offender. <clears throat> and there are other studies which have found a relationship between offender characteristics and crime scene behavior, but through a moderating variable. So for example, there is a study by Goodwill and Allison of stranger rapists. There have also been studies assessing whether offenders that show similar crime scene behavior have similar characteristics. If it is valid to predict an offender's characteristics from their crime scene behavior, then offenders with similar crime scene behavior should show similar characteristics. There are a few of these studies, but only very few, and only one of them has focused on sexual offenses, which is a study by Mokros and Allison. And unfortunately, this study did not find any support for the assumption of homology, which is what underpins offender profiling. Most studies of other crime types have also failed to find evidence for the homology assumption. However, it might be that we're looking for the wrong type of relationships. 
Personality psychology would predict that there would be relationships between crime scene behavior and someone's cognitions, someone's emotions and their learning history, not necessarily with their demographic characteristics. So support for the homology assumption might be more forthcoming if we were assessing the association between crime scene behavior and personality traits. For example, impulsivity, tolerance for frustration, and personality disorder, <clears throat> as predicted by models such as Michelle and Schoder's cognitive affective processing system. <coughs> the only study to find support for the homology assumption to date <clears throat> took a much more theoretical approach and provided theoretical accounts for why one would expect a relationship between decisions regarding the shoes worn to a burglary by the offender as recorded in Schumach evidence and the relationship between the shoes and the offender's age, their employment status and the deprivation of his or her home location. These hypotheses went on to be supported by the research findings. Another reason for the lack of success to date in testing the homology assumption might be down to what's been called the profilability of crime scene behaviors. As Goodwill and Allison have said, we might only expect these sorts of relationships for behaviors that are more offender-driven and not influenced by situational factors. <clears throat> One limitation of much of the research I have referred to this morning is that it is based on the victim's report of what happened at the crime scene and it doesn't solicit information directly from the offender. So of course, what the offender tells you might not be accurate. However, I think there's certainly a place for research with the perpetrators themselves, and that complements what we can learn from the victims. In 2015, Kinga Komazinska and I published a book chapter based on interviews that she had conducted with some serial sexual offenders and serial sexual murderers. These were really interesting, and demonstrated the considerable variability in perpetrator behavior within stranger sex offending. So for example, some offenders were highly consistent, yet they didn't perceive themselves to be. Instead, they talked about how their behavior changed over time due to victim behavior, their offenses becoming interrupted by a third party <clears throat> due to an evolving sexual fantasy or through refining how they controlled their victims. Some offenders committed their crimes in a very impulsive way, with their victim choice being opportunistic. In contrast, others went to great lengths to plan their crimes and conducted reconnaissance on the victim or the offense location. Sexual fantasy and mood were very important in determining the offender's behavior during the offense. So there is a considerable literature out there on stranger sex offending and serial sex offending, and it's hard to do it justice in 45 minutes. So I hope I have given you a sufficient taster of what has been studied to date. But I also thought it was important to consider where the gaps in our knowledge lie. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that much of the research I have referred to occurred at least a decade ago and thus it feels out of date. Police analysts have certainly told me that sexual offending behavior is changing over time. For example, due to changes in our sexual practices and the role of the internet in our lives. This is something that warrants study with explicit consideration given to how this might impact on the effectiveness of police techniques such as geographical profiling and crime linkage analysis. For example, the internet is changing the approach styles used by offenders, and these approaches are now occurring in a virtual world rather than in a physical world with geographical locations. Whether it is possible to profile someone's characteristic from their crime scene behavior is something that needs more attention. Research to date has not been successful in demonstrating direct links between crime scene behavior and demographic characteristics. However, psychological theory would question why we might expect such a, such a relationship or whether we would only expect such a relationship for certain behaviors. We are much more likely to observe a relationship between someone's crime scene behavior and their psychological characteristics such as their personality traits and their tendencies. And this is an area that is ripe for study. 
For such information, we might be able to hypothesize, sorry, from such information, we might be able to hypothesize how an offender would behave in a different situation. So how might he or she behave at home or in the workplace? This might help the police better understand the offender, but it might not give them direct leads that they can follow to apprehend the offender. However, if one found associations between crime scene behavior and forms of mental illness or mental disorder, this might help narrow down the pool of suspects. Finally, turning our attention back to crime linkage analysis and studies of stranger sexual offending, much of the literature is limited to particular countries, and it's really important that we see other countries represented in the research, particularly since cultural differences could impact on crime scene behavior and therefore the effectiveness of these policing techniques. We must also ensure we design studies with robust methodologies. In the UK, there is a great concern about police, policing being evidence-based, much like the evolution we've seen in medicine becoming evidence-based. This means that if we are generating research findings that could have practical application to real-world policing, we must ensure that our samples and our methods closely approximate those used by police practitioners. We need to be wary of small sample sizes and samples with poor ecological validity. To give you an example, much of the research we have conducted on the assumptions of crime linkage has used samples of approximately 100 crimes. This is concerning when you contrast these numbers to those that practitioners work with on a daily basis. So the database in the UK that is used for crime linkage analysis for sexual crimes contains more than 28,000 sexual offences, most of them against strangers. There is therefore a real risk that if our samples are not representative, because they are too small, our findings will not generalise to real-world policing. This is not to say that there is not an important place for studies with smaller samples, more I'm saying that we need to strive for as large and realistic a sample as possible. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry about my cough. <laughs> and have we got time for questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, that was... <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. An excellent presentation. Um, si quieren hacer alguna pregunta, alguna cuestión, ahora es el... Tenemos un ratito, unos minutos, yo creo, sí. Eh, hasta el cuarto quiero empezar la pausa café. Si alguien quiere aportar alguna cosa, algún comentario. Sí, en catalán, en castellano, sí, sí, claro. Ah, pero pueden participar. Pueden preguntar, sí. No, no. Yo también pueden preguntar. ¿Y y dónde se ve? En el ordenador, ¿no? ¿Cómo está? Si alguien pregunta fuera en el ordenador y nos dice la pregunta, bueno, digo. No hay nada. Bueno. Pues si no hay ninguna pregunta, yo sí que quería hacer eh, algún comentario final. Porque realmente, bueno, mm, yo supongo que les ha parecido excelente la presentación. Para mí ha sido un gusto poderla escuchar porque realmente nosotros hemos trabajado en este campo eh, y, la, y la investigación justo mm, se centra sobre lo que ha estado explicado Jessica. Y entonces yo, yo sí que quiero resaltar de su exposición pues, tres o cuatro cosas que me han parecido muy relevantes y que realmente poniéndolas en relación con con lo que nosotros vamos a presentar posteriormente, bueno, pues nos aporta también mucho ¿no? respecto a no, nuestros resultados. En primer lugar, eh, 
que sería una conclusión final, pero ya lo he dicho al principio, eh, la necesidad de replicar todo este tipo de estudios, aunque hablemos de eh, sex offenders y, y agresores sexuales, y pensemos que se puede hablar en términos generales, tienen que ser estudios muy aplicados a la localidad concreta y al, y al marco eh, cultural concreto. ¿no? Nosotros nos hemos dado cuenta, y después eh, supongo que tenemos ocasión de hablarlo, que nosotros también hemos hecho un, un estudio sobre una muestra nacional y y cuando lo hemos puesto, eh, eh, hemos compartido esos esa resultados de investigación con investigadores eh, policiales precisamente de toda España, una de las conclusiones que se sacaron de ese seminario era es que necesitaban eh, recoger de, de una manera mucho más precisa los perfiles eh, que se encontraban más próximos a su localidad o a su región, porque las regiones son muy diferentes y los comportamientos pueden ser diferentes y, como ha dicho Jessica, depende de la cultura, en el lugar donde nos encontremos, eh, la escena es diferente, la aproximación a la víctima del agresor es distinta, la utilización de armas es distinta, por lo cual, bueno, pues todo... Todo esto que estamos aprendiendo de otros estudios nos sirve para utilizar metodologías similares, pero mmm, vuelvo a incidir en sobre lo que ha dicho Jessica, que sí que nosotros también nos lo hemos encontrado, que necesitamos replicar eso en muestras más locales o en diferentes nacional, eh, naciones o en diferentes países. ¿no? Por un lado esto, y luego eh, ha hablado también del perfil geográfico y, la, y la, la utilidad de utilizar el perfil geográfico en este tipo de, de, bueno, de, de delitos y también en otros, eh, sabemos nosotros en criminología y que, que eso es muy útil, es una herramienta útil y realmente… Mmm, hay expertos como César San Juan que, que me podrá contradecir o no y, y confirmar en esa afirmación, pero yo creo que hasta ahora nos hemos basado mucho en aspectos más situacionales o de la escena o más… Eh, geográficos. ¿no? Ella planteaba la posibilidad de relacionar esos aspectos geográficos también con características eh, psicológicas del autor ¿no? y cómo podía incidir en eso, en la distancia recorrida, en cómo se, cómo se mueve el agresor en el espacio. Bueno, pues eso creo que es un campo a explorar, que, bueno, me, si me equivoco me corrige César, pero creo que hay menos estudios en ese ámbito y creo que es una línea eh, muy interesante para explorar, porque realmente, bueno, pues, pues puede haber diferencias en cuanto a la, a la persona o los aspectos más individuales de los agresores, tenemos que ir afinando de estas, de estas grandes conclusiones que nosotros tenemos actualmente, bueno, ir afinando y eh, establecer diferencias. Luego, otra aportación muy importante y creo que, que bueno, para todos es una novedad y, y, bueno, y sobre todo para las fuerzas y cuerpos de seguridad en España creo que es muy útil, es la aportación del Crime Link Touch, ¿no? de, esta, de esta línea de investigación eh, que lo que pretende es intentar buscar eh, eh, a, o sea, a, eh, comportamientos o hechos similares para ver si efectivamente pertenecen a la misma persona y conseguir ver, asociar esos hechos a, a, la, a la persona, a posibles sospechos y ver si existe una posibilidad de agresor serial. ¿no? Eso es, eh, supone un cambio eh, sustancial en cuanto a la mejora y el avance de la eficacia en las investigaciones, porque podemos relacionar esos hechos y ver si efectivamente corresponden a una misma persona y entonces nuevos hechos puede, podemos intentarlos relacionar con los antiguos que nosotros tenemos y, y así priorizar sospechosos. ¿no? Para eso, ¿qué se necesita? Pues una base de datos como tienen en Reino Unido, ¿no? que me parece que ha dicho que tiene 28.000 casos incorporados en esas bases de datos centralizadas, que pueden de alguna manera incorporar nuevos hechos y ver esas similitudes ¿no? entre los hechos anteriores y poder mejorar la investigación futura. Eso sería para nosotros un sueño, ¿no? Y lo estuvimos hablando también la, en el seminario que compartimos con investigadores, ¿no? La posibilidad de incorporar todos esos datos en una base de datos y que se pudiera luego analizar con todas las variables que se, relevantes para que pudieran eh, hacer este crime linkage, ¿no? Y que y pudiera de alguna manera el futuro mejorar. Creo que es una línea que tendríamos que explorar y desde el punto de vista de las fuerzas y cuerpos de seguridad, animarlos a que. <risa> Desde, desde el interior intenten eh, hacer todo lo posible para que eso sea, sea una realidad y bueno, Jessica también nos, nos ayer nos, nos dio la oportunidad de que en futuras ocasiones, en reuniones internacionales en las que se puedan poner en, en común resultados de esta, de esta línea de investigación puedan participar también los cuerpos españoles o nosotros para poder ver buenas prácticas en, el, en otros países. ¿Mm? Y creo que no tenía... Perdón. 
Creo que son un poco las grandes conclusiones que yo he sacado de esta, de esta ponencia en referencia al, a nuestra investigación y a lo largo de la mañana podemos ser, seguir debatiendo sobre estas cuestiones. Thank you, Jessica, again. <ríe> Gracias a todos y ahora yo creo que podemos dar paso a la pausa café de media hora y luego retomar. ¿No? Ah, 15, perdón, 15, 15, 15 minutos y luego retomamos a la mesa siguiente. Muchas gracias.